Also because it helps us to bring old friends like Carlos back as well to the, to the Cypress Institute. Um, so uh, Louis is a, is a biologist specializing in marine biodiversity and marine ecology, especially around the coasts of, uh, of Cyprus, uh, with expertise on, on the effects of marine protected areas, invasive species and artificial reefs on fisheries, and also vice versa, so the impact of fisheries on all these things and a special interest on the, on the effects of natural and, and uh, human disturbances in priority habitats and, and on vulnerable species. He co-founded the NGO in Alia Fisis, uh, the Environmental Research Center in 2009, um, with the aim of conducting and promoting environmental research and encouraging education and ecological awareness of the wider public in Cyprus and, and currently serving as research director, I think also currently involved in the uh, lionfish uh, uh, various lionfish control or, uh, campaigns as well, and, and lots of other projects. And lots of other projects. Wouldn't, wouldn't mention so um, I will I will uh, leave the introductions there, and I uh, and uh, I I wish you all a very interesting uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the Cyprus Institute for for inviting me. Um, if you cannot hear me, just please let me know, and I'll, I'll raise the volume. Um, Thank you all for coming on this very special day for Cypriots. Because, <laughs> as you know, it's a, a day that most Cypriots quit working before before lunch and start eating and drinking. I had to struggle not to drink Zivania uh, before lunch. So, thank you for for making the effort and coming. So, I think Nick more or less uh, gave a nice introduction for me. Um, I will talk to you about. Uh, natural and anthropogenic disturbances in the marine environment of Cyprus. Um, I wasn't sure how to how to uh, give a t title for my presentation because sometimes natural and anthropogenic are, are the same thing, or sometimes uh, the natural uh, disturbances are uh, influenced and also magnified by anthropogenic um, actions. So, in any case. Um, I realized while producing this uh, presentation that so many of our projects involve disturbances either directly or indirectly in the marine environment. So I made a choice of some of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, subjects and these are what I will be presenting to you today. Um, just a few words about who we are but I think Nick already uh, mentioned all of this. We were founded in 2009. Our main aim was to conduct and promote environmental research in the marine environment but also in the terrestrial ecosystem even though now the last few years we're focusing mostly on the marine environment and uh, also to encourage and enhance education and environmental awareness and to support, improve and promote conservation. We work with a variety of, of research topics, including shallow water ecology, fisheries, benthic ecology, uh, mapping of priority species and habitats, especially in marine protected areas. Um, also have <coughs> projects uh, regarding the ecology of ancient and modern shipwrecks. We work with artificial reefs, paleoecology, invasive species, as you will see in, in, uh, in uh, the next few minutes. Uh, marine litter, in the past we have done projects with freshwater and coastal wetlands as well as with ornithological research. And we support a lot university students, especially with their, th with, with their thesis, uh, as well as internships uh, of graduates. We receive graduates for their internships, we <coughs> visit schools and try to lecture also at universities, college and institutes, just like we're doing here, in order to promote environmental awareness, as well as also through media. Now I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of uh, an introduction because I assume that most of you are, are not dealing with the marine environment. Um, in the Mediterranean, let's start with the larger scale. It's an oligotrophic, uh, much more oligotrophic than other areas. In, in, the, in the world, meaning that it's low in primary productivity. Um, it's a small body of water compared to the world's oceans. It's only 1.1% of the surface. 
uh, but it is also uh, high in biodiversity as well as a hotspot for marine bioinvasions. Just a few numbers, just to understand, by 2000 there were 664 fish species recorded based on the literature, and in 2013 there were 750 fish species recorded, out, out of which 120 were alien. In 2017, 821 alien species, not just fish, or all taxa, uh, were recorded. Now, the Levantine, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, from the Aegean and further east, it's more oligotrophic even. It has higher salinity, higher temperatures, um, as well as a rising trend of sea surface temperatures, and it's a hotspot of what is called Lesepsian migration, uh, which has an east to west gradient. What is Lesepsian migration? It's the migration of alien species from the Red Sea and into the the Mediterranean through the Suez Channel. Now, the marine environment in Cyprus, it hosts a lot of important habitats, habitats that are listed in the uh, EU directive of priority habitats, such as uh, Posidonia meadows, reefs, submerged caves, and many others. Um, and it also hosts important and vulnerable at the same time uh, species, such as uh, uh, two species of turtles, monk seals, and elasmograms, a lot of species of elasmograms, uh, rays and sharks. Um, now, the Levantine in general uh, so it has a lower species rich and richness than the West, and this is uh, attributed sometimes to the higher temperatures and higher salinity, but also it's uh, another reason is that there is less intensive sampling effort. So there is less research, uh, so less taxa or even habitats um, identified. Uh, as I said, the Levantine is a hotspot of Lesepsian migration, and Cyprus is the first European, well, EU country uh, that receives all these um, uh, Lesepsian migrants. Uh, for example, by tw 2015, there were more than 15 alien fishes, fish species recorded. Now there are a lot more. Uh, and also, it's an area where there is extensive disturbance. Now, what we mean with the, with the disturbances? There is a, a, a big list of, of uh, disturbances, but I think the most important ones, and some of which we will um, talk about in the next uh, few slides, in the next slides, is first of all climate change, which is uh, basically induced by increasing temperatures and also intensified and severe storms. Uh, fisheries, uh, fisheries is, is by, by default uh, a disturbance on the marine environment, especially when it deals with the bycatch. Again, I will talk about bycatch in the next few slides. And overexploitation, overfishing. Uh, invasive species uh, can, of course, disturb the natural balance of, of the ecosystem. Pollution, eutrophication marine litter and coastal development. I'm sure most of you uh, visit the coast around Cyprus and, and it's very hard to find areas where there is no buildings. So uh, I will start with the first of the, of the subjects and I will talk about projects that we have worked ongoing, current projects at Analia, uh, dealing with the effects of fisheries on vulnerable species. This is a project called Understanding Multi-Taxa Bycatch of Vulnerable Species and Testing Mitigation, a collaborative approach in Cyprus. This is a project funded by uh, MAVA Foundation. Our partners are uh, BirdLife International University of Exeter, BirdLife Cyprus, and SPOT, uh, an NGO from the north. It's a bicommunal project. And what is exactly the problem that we are dealing with through this project? Bycatch is the unintentional catch of discards, uh, including vulnerable species. We're dealing with vulnerable species in this project. Uh, so just to make it more simple, is fishermen use specific gears, nets, long lines, in order to target uh, specific taxa, commercial ones. But at the same time, they catch 
other other species because uh, their method is not so um, restrictive. So uh, it's a, it's a very important threat, and the vulnerable species that we are trying to collect information on through this project is sea turtles, cetaceans, and seals, so marine mammals, <coughs> seabirds, and elasmobranchs. So this is a key conservation issue in the Mediterranean, but also in the world. Um, before we started with this project, the scale of the problem was unknown. That's what we were trying to do, quantify the bycatch rate, uh, and also to develop and implement solutions to prevent bycatch, which is a, a very challenging issue. So we aimed, to we aimed and we succeeded in developing and training teams of onboard observers. We had people going on board with fishermen to record uh, the data that we needed to record. We managed to build trust, which is very important, between uh, our experts and the fishing industry. Um, we tried to implement target specific studies in order to identify important at sea areas for vulnerable species and to understand uh, at a fine spatial scale where the problem is. At the same time, we tried to raise awareness uh, with key stakeholders, fishermen, uh, fishmongers, restaurant owners, and also the consumers. Uh, to strengthen fisheries management and fisheries policy and to develop the capacity in both NGOs and government institutions to tackle this problem. So after two years of, of uh, onboard observations, we got uh, results. Um, I realized uh, uh, about an hour ago that this is an, not an updated table, but you get the picture. We managed after more than 300 onboard observations to uh, make a, a, a list of all the taxa, all the species that get caught. So we know now which species have a problem. And uh, we also know through which gear type most uh, species are being caught. So trammel nets, oh, sorry. So we know that with trammel nets, there is uh, some species being caught with pelagic longlines, gill nets, etc. And we've managed to identify in a, in a spatial, in a small spatial scale, we, where different taxa are being caught. So why is this important? We know where to focus our conservation um, efforts. So here, as you can see, this is the Bay of Larnaga. We know that uh, fishermen uh, bycatch Gareda Gareda. They bycatch different kinds of species of, of sharks and rays. So what can be done? Uh, we intend to conduct mitigation trials. We will use a specific kind of equipment to try and, and minimize the bycatch, such as, for example, LED lights, with, which have been found to deter um, turtles. So we will test this, this, uh, this equipment. We are trying also at the same time to change the perception and increase the awareness of stakeholders, especially fishermen, to teach them also to safely release vulnerable species in case they get ca caught, and also to propose conservation measures to the authorities. We move on now to the second uh, part of the, of the talk, when we will talk about invasive species, as I said, there are a lot of alien species uh, recorded now in, in the waters around Cyprus. Not all of them are invasive. Uh, basically, invasive species are the ones that manage to get established and uh, grow in numbers, expand, and, um, and have a negative effect on the local fauna. So I will give you an example of, an, of a very invasive species, uh, the lionfish. This is a project that has been going on since 2017 with partners uh, of the University of Cyprus, they are the coordinators, uh, MER, uh, another company from, from Cyprus, the Department of Fisheries, and the University of Plymouth. And it's, uh, <coughs> it aims to um, toggle the invasion, basically, of the lionfish in the Mediterranean. 
I have a small video to show, which is a very short clip that was being made. It was made by Brut, and I think it illustrates the problem very clearly and simply. Oops. Stop again when Carlos shows up. Uh, I think you get the picture. And just a few facts known from from other regions. Uh, so we knew about the lionfish being a problem before it arrived in the Mediterranean. Uh, we knew that it inhabits shallow waters as well as deep waters. It's a long-lived species; can live more than ten years. Uh, it has venom on the spines. Uh, which are found along dorsal and, and anal fins. It has a high daily consumption of prey of 3 to 6 percent of their body weight. It's a generalist predator, can grow up to 43 centimeters and more than one uh, kilogram uh, in weight. It can sexually mature in less than a year, and the females can lay over 2 million eggs per year. So, knowing all this, we knew that as soon as it arrived in Cyprus, they were troubled. Um, it was first recorded in the Mediterranean in 1992 in Israel, but then there was a big gap where nothing was, was seen again. And then again, and then in 2012, it show up, showed up again in Lebanon. And then since 2014, it arrived in Cyprus and started expanding rapidly all around the island. And then, of course, in the rest of the Mediterranean, going westwards, it has reached all the way until Tunisia and, uh, and Malta. There was also one record in Sicily, but it was just one record and nothing since then. So through the project, we have been monitoring uh, sightings as well as ourselves going in the water and, and, and uh, counting lionfish in specific areas. Excuse me. So through this uh, monitoring, we have found that through the years, uh, since 2013, that it was first recorded, sorry, not 14, uh, we reached 2018-19, and we found that there is an increase in density, and particularly in the eastern side of the island. So potential threats to the biodiversity, they have an impact on foundation species and ecosystem engineers. They can act synergistically with other stress stressors, uh, like for example, increased temperature. And the increase in temperature actually in the Mediterranean is something that helps them spread in other regions. Um, they have the potential uh, to increase algal growth basically by them feeding on uh, herbivorous, uh, fish species, then algal growth can, uh, can be um, enhanced. Uh, they compete with native predators and they can cause significant reductions in native species. At the same time, they have potential socioeconomic impacts. 
by uh, decrease in abundance of commercially important species, uh, the degradation of important habitats. They can also pose a public threat uh, in health threats due to the venomous spines and uh, also deter diving tourists and bathers. Even though actually the diving tourism is not being deterred, they are actually more interested as we found out and most tourists, they want to see the line of fish. Now, we collected samples and ran a gonadal analysis uh, of uh, a number of, of specimens and we found that also in, in the Mediterranean they can reproduce year round and that the females are more reproductively active during the summer. At the same time, we uh, dissected uh, a number of specimens and we've did, we did stomach content analysis and we've uh, found out and proven that uh, they eat mostly native fish. So what can be done about this problem and what we are doing through the project? Uh, we, of course, develop the capacity and the mechanism to tackle the invasion, even though that it's, uh, we, are, we are finding it very hard to, to minimize or keep the numbers low. Um, we already assess the risks. We are trying to increase awareness and create a social capital. Uh, we have already created a surveillance and early detection system, an application that people, the citizens, can use to uh, record and report to us where they see the lionfish. We've developed removal action teams, volunteers basically, that assist and help us to uh, remove lionfish from specific areas, especially from priority habitat <coughs> areas uh, such, such as MPAs and, and Nadura 2000. And, and at the same time, we are trying to explore potential small local market niches. Of course, we are promoting it for consumption. It's a very tasty fish, and so we are promoting it through the fishermen, the restaurants, so for people to start consuming it more regularly, because they've already started. But we need to increase the consumption. Uh, there is also um, some jewelry that can be made with the fins. Uh, so we are trying different different uh, ways, uh, and at the same time we've developed tools for managers. Uh, ones tools that we are trying to transfer uh, also to neighboring countries. We will move on to the third subject, the third topic of my talk, and this deals with marine litter. I'm sure you all you all are witness witnesses of, uh, of marine litter uh, in all the beaches, in all the coastline and in the sea. But let's just define it just for the sake of defining it. Marine litter is solid waste produced by human activity, either on sea or land, and discarded on purpose or accidentally. Yes, there are people who discard it accidentally uh, on purpose, and uh, which end up, uh, ends up in the marine environment three types of marine litter, floating marine litter, marine litter found on the beach, and also seabed marine litter. And of course, most of the marine litter, as mentioned before, some estimates are up to 80% originates on land. Uh, in the picture there, you can see one of the worst examples of, of, uh, of a landfill, it's situated in Lebanon, and you can see that with any storm, with any rain, with any wind, all of the marine lit all of the litter ends up in the marine environment. So where does actually the marine litter come from? Sources of marine litter include litter dropped in towns and cities, overflowing litter bins, uh, poorly managed industrial waste discharges. Uh, lost shipping containers, there's a list there that explains uh, how marine litter ends up in the sea. And of course everybody has a, has a, a um, contribution, all of us have a contribution to all this. Either we like it or not. What are the impacts of marine litter? Marine uh, animals many times ingest 
uh, marine litter, thinking that it's a natural uh, prey of theirs, uh, and ends up in their stomachs, many times causing death. Uh, they can also get it trapped by marine litter. Um, such as this example, or through ghost fishing, which is, which is basically uh, fishing nets or other fishing gear that becomes entrapped and stays in, in the bottom of the sea. Um, habitat damage, and of course, one that really concerns us is the uh, <coughs> microplastics and the accumulation of pollutants uh <coughs> that can also end up in the seafood that we eat. What we can do about it? Uh, there's a lot of things. First of all, from this list, I think the one that should be first on the list is to refuse it. We try to uh, not use single-use uh, single, uh, plastics, but if we really have to, then it would be very beneficial if we can it, use trash, uh, properly can it, um, or stow it, or uh, refuse to use it, we already mentioned it, remove it also from the, from the uh, marine uh, environment if we see it, uh, reuse whatever plastic we use, or recycle. Just briefly to mention one of the projects we have dealing with this program is called Marlit CY. It's an EU-funded project, a bi-communal project. Uh, partners include MASTER and the Association of Divers from the North, as well as ACTI, another NGO uh, in Cyprus. And it's called uh, Marine Lead CY, Marine Litter for Synergies, Capacity Building, and Peace Building. The activities include uh, a responsible cost of business campaign. We do um, events where we go with fishermen and remove uh, litter from the sea, fishing for litter. Uh, we participate in policy making events trying to, um, to uh, make known the, how big the problem is to policy makers. Uh, <coughs> we also have activities of, on capacity building uh, and educational for children and youth. And it's an island-wide awareness raising campaign and we also have joint competitions on marine litter. Just to give you an example of some of the results after the cleanups that we do, we also count uh, what it was found. And in just one cleanup, we found 8,000 cigarette butts in one beach. So you can imagine the extent of the problem. Most of these cigarette butts were not seen. You cannot see them. But as soon as you start sieving the sand, the problem is there. And from all of our campaigns in 2019, from beach and seabed cleanups, we've identified more than 50% uh, being, um, as I said earlier, cigarette butts, 34% was plastic, 7% um, was paper, there was metal, hygienic and medical waste found, glass, wood, and, and many others. So, we, we move on to the last uh, um, subject of the talk, which uh, will uh, focus on the impact on priority habitats. Two projects we will, I will present. The first one uh, deals with Cladopara gaspidosa. It's a, it's a scleractinian coral, I will explain later. And the project is called uh, Cladopara gaspidosa in a rapidly changing environment effects from eutrophication, windstorm, and warming events. So, Cladopora is a scleractinian coral, and it's included in the priority habitat called reefs. It's one of the species that can uh, uh, form reefs, even though um, it actually can form large bioconstructions at the time, because reefs, when we mention reefs, we always imagine large reefs, such as the ones found in in the tropics, but this is not the case for the moment. It's a constructional coral, it's colonial, and it uh, lives symbiotically with zoosanthelis, so it has the ability to photosynthesize. In the past, in the Pleistocene, it was able to form large reefs, but now, currently, at this time, it has a patchy distribution in the Mediterranean and in Cyprus. It's an endangered species uh, that can support high biodiversity, 
But we have witnessed multiple mortality events in the past due to warming. We chose two study sites uh, in the southeast of Cyprus, uh, very close to each other. One is Crionero, it's an area which is naturally with low nutrient and high, high population of, of colonies, of Clavogora colonies. And the other one is at Leopetri, situated right in front of a hatchery. Uh, so it's an area that uh, has high nutrients, mainly because of the activities of the hatchery, but also from agricultural activities. And it also hosts a last, large population of this uh, coral. We run water analysis, <coughs> nutrient analysis in the water uh, of both areas, and we've identified that at the high nutrient area, uh, <coughs> at Leopetri, uh, the levels of nitrates and, and ammonia were 10 times higher than, than at the naturally oligotrophic area, as well as phosphates also were much higher. So what we did, we monitored on a monthly basis using photographic uh, equipment. We took pictures of, uh, I think, 70 colonies from each area on a monthly basis. And in the summer, during the summer of 2015, when temperatures were uh, the highest of the year, we witnessed gradual necrosis, um, uh, the deterioration of the living tissue. As you can see here, this is a picture of this colony in July. In August, there was gradual uh, necrosis, and by September, the, the colony was completely dead. So what we did, we compared, uh, first of all, between 2015 and 2014, where temperatures were lower. With the green line, you can see the sea surface temperature anomalies. So in the summer of 2014, there was a bit of anomaly, but not that high. Uh, so there was a bit of necrosis observed, but not so much. But in 2015, uh, there was a significant increase in the necrotic, necrotic areas of colonies. And it coincided with really high uh, sea surface temperature anomalies. At the same time, we compared the two areas, the eutrophic and the oligotrophic area. The red bars show uh, the necrosis in the obedri, the, the eutrophic area, and in blue, the low, low uh, nutrient area. And there was a significant difference with uh, basically the area at the high uh, nutrient uh, levels having much higher recent necrosis. <clears throat> so, during the course of our monitoring in the winter of 2015, we also witnessed uh, a severe storm hitting the area, at, especially at Crio Nero, the low nutrient area, uh, which was quite severe. And between the 5th and 6th of January, there were really high wind speeds recorded with huge waves uh, compared to other, other uh, periods hitting the coastline and the area where uh, the corals are found. So in this compiled <coughs> image of an actual photograph of the area and a 3D model that we created, you can see uh, that uh, there were boulders, big rocks that were caused by the wave energy hitting the cliffs and falling directly on top of the coral colonies. In yellow, you can see the coral colonies. <coughs> oh, this is moving really fast. In any case, here you can see an example of the mechanical damage that was caused by the big boulders hitting the, the corals directly. This is a, a picture of this colony before the storm, and this is after the storm. And we found huge boulders of more than 100 kilos in weight. Um, scattered around the, the area, uh, and we have estimated, and we've estimated through our monitoring that uh, we found five out of 70 colonies being directly damaged, which and which had more than uh, or approximately 50 percent of healthy tissue uh, reduced. So conclusions. Uh, 
coral deterioration, we associate it with increased sea surface tem <coughs> temperatures, uh, sea surface temperature anomalies. Elevated nutrient concentrations uh, are linked to increased mortality, especially when temperatures are higher. And we found that there is a growing risk to corals from the intensified storm climate. What can we do? Well, one thing that we can do is to enforce con conservation measures in areas with high abundance of these endangered species of coral. Uh, of course, try to minimize eutrophication, uh, anthropogenically induced eutrophication, uh, and perhaps to be able to conduct further experiments and mitigation trial tests, uh, such as, for example, transplanting uh, living colonies to areas where it's possible that the uh, impact will, will be less. The last project that I want to talk to you about is a, is a project that we actually just had starting. It's called POSBMET2 and it deals with the governance and the management of Posidonia beach dune systems across the Mediterranean. It's, it deals mostly with the coast, even though it's linked with the marine environment. Um, so what are these Posidonia banquettes? Uh, Posidonia banquettes, these dead leaves, uh, they are the accumulation of dead leaves of Posidonia oceanica. Posidonia oceanica is a sea grass, a plant uh, that lives in the sea and, uh, and produces, creates large meadows which are really high in biodiversity and is a very important habitat. It's also listed in the priority habitats uh, list of the EU directive. Um, and so these uh, meadows naturally uh, have leaves dying and, and leaving the meadow and the accumulation of this uh, ends up on beaches and we call these Posidonia banquettes. They are habitat forming ecosystem engineers and they can influence uh, in the hydrodynamicity of the environment. Uh, they can, cause, they can um, form a buffer on the coastal zone against erosion, something that is a very big issue in the, in the last few decades on coastal areas. And of course, they also have a relevant role in ecological processes, in the formation of dunes, and they are also a source of nutrients. So the project aims to manage the, the Mediterranean coastline by developing planning strategies that recognize the value of this Posidonia beach, uh, the Posidonia banquettes, along with dunes environment and integrate them into the overall coastal strategy while also addressing concerns and educating stakeholders. Basically to try and make protected areas more adaptable and resilient to the effects of climate change and the accumulation of other impacts. Um, why is, uh, what is the problem actually? Well, one of the major challenges uh, faced today by, by uh, Mediterranean countries is of course the high demand uh, of tourism along its coast. And so banquettes that are uh, naturally formed or on a lot of the beaches that are being used by, by tourists are perceived as an aesthetic problem. Uh, they are perceived as, a, as a pollution, or as a noise, uh, especially in highly frequented tourist zones. And so most municipalities and communities that are uh, um, uh, manage the coastal areas, they remove them on a yearly, sometimes on a monthly basis. Um, we did some uh, interviews and questionnaires um, with, the, with the coastal municipalities and we found out uh, from the results that uh, we did this in five different European Mediterranean countries including Cyprus and we found that the way they use to remove the banquettes is mostly with heavy machinery, uh, such as power shovels and tractors and skid steers. Uh, and especially in Cyprus, we found that heavy machinery is, be is being used 88% of the time, much, much higher percentage than any other European country and any other of the Mediterranean countries that we've uh, surveyed. And so you can understand that by using this heavy machinery, other problems are being caused on the, on the beach. 
there is a lot of impact. At the same time, we also did questionnaires and interviews with uh, various stakeholders, including beach goers, beach users, uh, tourist companies, and local administrations in all five countries that I mentioned earlier. And we found that the perception of most of these stakeholders is that the Macedonian <coughs> banquets are negative. Their perception is totally negative. 41% found them negative, and only 33% were indifferent, with 26% being positive. So what we plan to do through this project, we plan to test ways, first of all, to monitor banquets. And one of the ways that we can do it is, is by using UAVs. Um, we want to try to test no removal versus partial removal and how this will have an effect on erosion of the beaches. Um, we want to try and build the capacity and raise the awareness to the public, but also to <coughs> beach cleaning personnel in order to make them use less impacting machinery, uh, perhaps with rubber tires or even sometimes by hand this can be done. And also uh, to promote different dis displacement options because now what the, they do when they collect the banquets, they go and dump them in landfills. But there are a lot of other ways to use them. Uh, but, and also the most important and perhaps the, the ideal way, if they have to remove them, is to temporarily remove them and then return them back to the beach for the winter season, which is the season when most of the erosion takes place, is when most of the storms take place. And of course to increase awareness of stakeholders. If you want to learn more or if you want to come in contact with me you can visit our website or our Facebook page and please don't hesitate to ask any questions or to contact me by email. Thank you very much. Mind some? No, I'm asking if there is any available well, or no. There are, there are some uh, ideas by uh, uh, some people that perhaps we, you could use other alien species to tackle this problem, but this is, this is not something that should be used. We have a lot of examples of other areas where another introduction was done to control an alien species and it had ended up in disaster. So. I think that, no, we don't have any idea. We don't have anything in mind now. Uh, we don't intend to use any biological uh, control other than using humans uh, to fish for them. Thank you. Yes. This is just a out of curiosity because I am living, I am from Spain and yeah. I live here for already for years. I never saw in uh, Spanish beaches, but uh, this I and uh, better in the Atlantic coast, these uh, Posidonian banquets. Is because they are completely taken away all the time because the beaches are very touristic, or, or is it because uh, they don't form over there? It's a complicated, it could be any of the reasons that you mentioned, but I think that uh, we have Spanish institutions collaborating with us in the project. Actually, IUCN is, is uh, the one uh, coordinating parts of this, of this project. Um, and uh, they have the same issue as we have in Cyprus. Yes, in the very, very uh, touristic areas, uh, Posidonia banquets are being uh, managed. They're being extracted, and uh, not just in the in the summer season, but all, all around the all, all through the year. So, depending on how touristic the beach is, the less chances are to see Posidonia banquets. Okay. Yeah. Yes. For the seagrass, this is of course is carbon sequestration. Right? So are, are, are we not considering to turn it into um, organic material or animal feed or, or compost it? Yes. So what, the nutritional value? Yes, 
there is, of course, as you mentioned, a lot of nutritional value, and it ha there are ha there have been a lot of uh, proposed solutions, uh, either as biofuel or as, or as a fer fertilizer. Um, I think that uh, there were. This is something that is being done abroad in some areas, but in Cyprus, uh, there were some efforts, but it's still not. Um, uh, it's, it's not a viable uh, business still. So uh, yesterday we had a, a meeting actually with the municipality of Larnaca, with whom we are uh, we are uh, trying to collaborate in order to do the testing that I mentioned uh, in some of their beaches, in one particular beach. And they said that they were um, contacted by different organizations, companies, uh, institutions to try and see uh, how much is the volume of the baguettes that they collect every year in order to see if it's, it's uh, feasible for them to, to, to use them. And I think that they, they did not continue further after they found out the amount, the volume of the Bosnian that is being collected. Yeah. But it's used, I think, for the isolation in the buildings. The, that's and another thing that they can be used for, yes, yes, true. The Larnaca is one of the areas that has this issue, especially in the Sarulimano area. They have an issue in but the port. There, the port line is when they compose, it's also a, an area that attracts a lot of people and it's also the smell that uh, yes. when it, 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 it composes. In more remote areas, I would totally agree, but in that area, in particular, it creates a, it's a... They have a problem in the port because yeah, the leaves the accumulate port. there and then... Exactly. The fishermen and all the other um, users of the port cannot go out and in of the port easily. So that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, you're right. Uh, sometimes they can smell Back funny. Yeah. <laughs> and it's another thing that uh, makes people think that they are uh, bad. Yes. Uh, sorry, is there a fear on the sea or Posidonia, the, uh, the banquets, and it's mostly a winter, wind in the winter. winter. They appear in the winter, yes. they accumulate in the winter, yes. Uh, I have a old apartment in uh, Menu, if you go from the airport all the way to Faros, yes. and uh, all the way to Idi and Marcos. Now that area, uh, it has hundreds of uh, apartment complexes, and it's standard procedure every spring, March, April, uh, hundreds of trucks take away the Positonians. I, I don't know why they take them, either by the local government itself or by the complex uh, committees. Uh, even though these, uh, those uh, 10 kilometers of uh, coast, they have a very, very serious problem of uh, erosion. Yes. The sea comes uh, inside every, every year, about uh, a few feet every year. Yes. But, uh, and uh, not only do they take all the Posidonia, uh, you know, with huge machinery and trucks away, but they also bring uh, special machinery to level out the gravel and yeah. the sand along because, uh, because of the of tourists, uh, of the complexes. That is exactly, that, that is a perfect example of bad management. That they, yeah. This is what we're trying to tackle it's through this project. It's a standard procedure. Yes. Both yes. local government and the complexes uh, committees, uh, every spring, they will take away the countries of trucks mm -hmm. of uh, West Union. It's lovely. We have them now. I was there a few days yeah. ago. Yeah, I know. I know. And uh, we have them now. There's baguettes. It's uh, full of. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a My wife thing. doesn't like it because she's a swimmer, which is a swimmer, yeah. and uh, she will, will not go to where there are baguettes because she's. Uh, yes. Sensitive. <laughs> it's, it's a lack of knowledge, lack of awareness from, from the stakeholders, including the bathers, the, the beachgoers. Uh, because I'm sure that if people knew that this, this banquet, this habitat is beneficial and it reduces erosion, then they would look at it differently and they would seek different solutions. Because there are solutions that are being proposed. There is, for example, the solution of removing the banquets, the banquets. Uh, in the summer season, like displacing them and returning them as soon as the summer season is, is over. Yes, what I have uh, noticed throughout the years, 
been living there for 18 years now and reading uh, the Samuel case, is that uh, these, these Posidonia maggots, they move throughout the winter according to the, uh, you know, the, the waves, the wind, the direction and stuff. So one week we find them there, another week we find them uh, they, you know, they continuously yes. shift. Yeah. It doesn't stay one place. But they are affected by <coughs> the winter parameters. Yes. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> was there a question? Sorry. Uh, no, no, just was a, a comment. Uh, yes. Just an <laughs> observation. Yes, true. I have a question on the... Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Okay. There are like several questions on different topics. So one was related with the uh, Posidonia factors. I don't know if do you have like long-term data to know if they are growing in quantity over the time or not. Just to realize how how could be really be considered like some kind of threat for uh, tourism or not. And maybe that also will give you a clue on how to deal with different management strategies. The other thing was to ask whether uh, it's also uh, the NGO considering to work with other uh, impacts such as uh, ocean acidification or sound noise contamination. That I know could be also an issue, especially in places where you have a lot of boats going all the year around. And I think here Cyprus is probably one of those cases. Yes. Well, to answer your first question, we are now at the trying to collect information from the areas where we want to do the testing. And yes, there is information. Um, some municipalities, they keep record of how much they collect from each beach, actually, uh, because it's a, it's a big issue for them. It's, it's a, it costs a lot of money, estimating hundreds of thousands of euros to collect and to transfer um, into whatever they, they deposit them. So there is, there is information, we're collecting it, and we, we are hoping that there will be something there for us to work with. And uh, with, well, with regards to your second question, yes, of course we are interested, but um, we haven't had the opportunity yet to work with noise, uh, as you said, is, is a major issue. I think there, is, there was a project recently that came out from the Department of Fisheries uh, as a tender. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's only very recently it started being an issue okay. and being targeted. And the other... Was social more on the time of climate change? Yeah. You mentioned well, sea temperature and storms, but ocean acidification is also like... We, we wish we could count that also, that parameter, but I think it's quite tricky to... to analyze. I'm, I'm not very, very knowledgeable with, with how you can analyze uh, water samples, I, I suppose, and, and reach the, any assumption. Uh, question on the eutrophication mm -hmm. with the corals. So you have, you've shown a correlation, but you have two field sites, essentially. Is, is there an easy way I mean, can these corals be grown in aquariums so that you can actually experiment with them and, and prove cause and effect rather than, you know, simply a correlation? Yes. Uh, are they easy to grow and to experiment with? Yes, or? they are. Yeah. Yes, and we have done some experiments in, in aquaria. Uh, paradoxically, we found that uh, there wasn't much effect from the eutrophication because uh, we compared eutrophic and oligotrophic corals in different tanks. Uh, we did a, a big experiment in, in uh, the scientific center in Monaco. We transformed, we transported corals from Cyprus there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think that the problem with that was that it was a very short period of, of experiment. Um, it would be nice to follow up with that and, and do a, a longer experiment. We, if we don't have other questions, um, we can continue the conversation outside as usual. But I'd like us first to thank our speaker once again. Thank you.